Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Omar Farooq, and uh, I will be starting today's session with a few announcements. Um, if you have not already done so, please type your email and uh, name. I think uh, one of us will be recording because eventually you will get your uh, CME credits as a result. Please mute your mic if you are not talking. Um, and this session is recorded uh, really for the quality and education, quality improvement and education purposes. Um, in the spirit of ECHO, all teach, all learn approach, we will be on first name basis. Um, so I, I think we all know the hub team and I will be speaking. So allow me to share the uh, my screen. Um, all right. Can you all um, see my screen, the first slide now? Yes. Okay. So, and can you still see the um uh, the mode is okay everything looks good yes looking good okay so i think today we will cover the um, anca associated vasculitis i will um, just briefly go over uh, some classification of vasculitis in general um then touch base on anca vasculitis go over some histological patterns i have a case and um, we will discuss also the um some of the trials uh, for treatment. These are my disclosures. Um, uh, nothing relevant to uh, this disease condition. Um, so let me present a case of a patient of mine who uh, I have been taking care of care since 2006, 2007. Um, so he is at that time, I think was 64 uh, in 2005 with the history of high blood pressure for um, two decades. Um, he, his original presentation was um, acute kidney injury, creatinine 2.3, hematuria, proteinuria with 2.8. And uh, at that time he has P-ANCA positivity with, with myeloperoxidase. His biopsy showed seven out of 13 glomeruli were, were sclerosed already. There was classic finding. And, and I think for the audience, the, the, the fibronoid necrosis is a very hallmark, a classic finding for the ANCA associated passive vasculitis. There were crescentic uh, GN as well. Uh, there, was, there were also some lung changes, so chronic inflammatory changes with three millimeter nodule at that time. So patient was treated with um, um, uh, induction of remission therapy, cyclophosphamide, prednisone, for six months, this is back in 2005. And then at that time, uh, the maintenance regimen was used was uh, mycophenolate morphetil for 12 months. So um, going, uh, moving forward a year later in 2006, his creatinine came down um, uh, slightly, um, proteinuria improved, and then kind of, you know, uh, uh, went on and off and the MMF was actually continued beyond two years. Um, and then I think between 2008 and 2011, the creatinine stabilized between 1.5, 1.8 uh, and his proteinuria declined, but his ANCA remained positive uh, until 2012, his um, uh, hematuria was resolved, proteinuria was less than 500 milligram, anchors were negative. And uh, I think at that time, one of those visits is uh, MMF was stopped. So he, uh, let me go to the next slide by this one. So in 2015, um, he had a relapse. So, th so the point I want to make is, so there was initial disease, he was treated, um, there was a maintenance of um, um, uh, you know, remission. And then in 2005, 10 years after the original, he had, he undergone choly cholecystectomy. Um, and after that, he developed uh, a liver abscess. So he, he presented with uh, gross hematuria at that time and developed again, rise in creatinine from 2.2 nine to five point, like more than 5.6. So he um, was, I think, um, kind of treated with IV fluids, uh, was even transferred 
for the concerns for Anka, but when, once we gave him IV fluids, things you know um, started to settle down. His creatinine came down, so he was not treated with uh, any um, um, of the immunological therapy. We thought that this may be just AKI in the setting of MRSA abscess. Yes, Dr. Masood, go ahead. I mean, just uh, curious that uh, why you, I mean, uh, cell scepter not azotheroprene at that time, uh, yes, so I don't know the answer to it because uh, this was the the, 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 the whole treatment regimen was before even I, I started my, my fellowship. So, so this was an ongoing, I think I was the one in 2012 who stopped his medication. He, around that time, he came to my clinic. So I don't know back, like what was the, whether he had intolerance to, to azathioprine and it, it was actually never tried. He was primarily switched from, um, the uh, after six months to uh, MMF. And I think for the audience, the uh, in this disease condition, we have more data on azathioprine as Dr. Masood rightfully questioned over management. Um, any Anything else before I go to the next? So he, um, I, I, and I think when we, when he was in with this cholecystectomy admission, this was the cholecystectomy was done on an out, in an outside hospital. So he was actually transferred to us for hematuria. Uh, and because of the liver abscess and active infection, we treated his infection and we did not uh, treat him with, um, uh, you know, any uh, steroids or anything. And he was sent back off once the creatinine came down. As you could see on the right hand of screen, the first rise in creatinine uh, on arrival, we gave him IV fluids, antibiotics, and creatinine came down very nicely. This is back in uh, uh, 2015 admission. So uh, he was sent back, um, uh, and then a few months later, I think he was at rehab. So he developed a skin rash, he developed GI bleeding, he developed respiratory failure, and then he was shipped to us again uh, 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 and at that time, I, I think we, uh, the, the diagnosis of a relapse of vasculitis was made and I thought maybe the infection and everything kind of triggered the relapse or some immune, immune uh, event. And he at that time was treated with, um, uh, I mean, he needed dialysis. He needed, we, we actually did plasma phoresis on him as well. And he was given high dose steroids along with rituximab. Um, and then I think, um, again, MMF was chosen as the maintenance therapy. Once he resolved the initial episode of renal failure, he actually recovered to the point that he came off of dialysis. He was discharged without any oxygen and he's, he's back to his baseline. So a um, couple of years uh, kind of uh, later, creatinine now stabilized between 3.1 to 3.7, proteinuria 1.1 to 1.5 grams no hematuria and his ANCA MPO remained negative. More recently, his creatinine has gone up to kind of high fours and fives. He's still not on dialysis. And he still remains on MMF. And um, I think our decision is to keep him as long as possible. Question is, um, anybody would have treated him differently? What do you guys think about uh, his course so far? So again, uh, just a point to make that this started back in 2005. This is 2021. He's in his now late 70s. He's a very active guy, not on dialysis, uh, doing fairly well, needs some uh, anemia management, blood pressure management, other things. Um, any any um, comments from the colleagues, like if you would have managed differently or do different things? I mean, I mean, at that time, uh, about six years ago, probably mm -hmm. I would do the same thing. But uh, the only question is that now, if this patient comes to now, uh, would we give him a plasmophoresis or not? Uh, or whether we would treat him, uh, I mean, with cyclophosphamide or ruxibam, but I know that the patient already has some bad infection. You don't want to kill him with the infection uh, complication. So, I mean, I, I probably would do the same thing. Just uh, the discussion for the sake of discussion is that whether uh, we, would you do a plasma phoresis at now in this patient if he present nowadays or you would do the same thing even now? 
So I think as of now, he just comes for every three, four months, his clinic visits, um, and he's not having any symptoms as of now. He's no, I'm saying that this, this patient would present the same symptoms, I mean, same presentation now after six same years. So if he has another relapse, which is, so what would you do? Okay. Yep. I think that's a, that's a good question. So anybody, so, so, so the hypothetical situation is this patient comes back to you with another relapse and his creatinine, I mean, he, he, he may have, say, GI bleeding or respiratory symptoms. What would you do? Anybody wants to take a shot on this? I mean, obviously, uh -huh. this patient, okay, sorry, go ahead. No, I mean, I'm, I'm just asking, Aurangzeb is here, Dr. Aga, do you want to say something, Daniel? I think Oves was mm -hmm. speaking on comment. Go ahead, Oves, please. I mean, uh, this patient, if he he did pretty good on rituximab, but again, if he relapsed, I think he needs a different therapy. Uh, probably he would need a cyclophosphamide uh, this time if he did this time. So, so you change the the one. Okay, that's that's a good suggestion. So, you know. I mean, the other the other thing, Omar, sorry. Go ahead, please. Well, he's 70 plus, that creatinine is already five. I mean, I'm not sure if uh, more immunosuppression will be a good option here or not. I think that, that's a very nice valid point. Yep. And one thing is, uh, did you do a renal biopsy back in 2015, a repeat biopsy? No, not at, not in 15 repeat kidney biopsy was not done, but we did, uh, I think when we did the bronchial washing and somebody did the lung biopsy at that time, and there was vasculitis in the lungs. So uh, a progressive rise in serum creatinine from, uh, let's say, 2005 till 2021 and five, I think there will be a pretty uh, broad spec kind of IFTA in renal biopsy. And that is only if the kidney size is normal only. In that case, we may be able to do biopsy. So I think in a relapse now, if the serum creatinine is stay, uh, stays around five, probably I would not give an immunosuppression for kidneys. But regarding the extra renal manifestation, um, I think you suppose that the patient may be presenting with respiratory symptoms. So in that case, that will determine what are we going to do then? Because at the age of 70 with the history of MRSA liver abscess, it's the matter of saving the patient or the kidney with immunosuppression. I think all, all valid points. So, um... I probably were in the same dilemma, I think, uh, five, six years ago. And um, so, so a couple of comments here. So, uh, you know, whatever happened in 2005, that's kind of ancient, ancient history. Uh, I think he got a very solid induction. MMF was being experimentally tried at that time. I think the big MMF prophylaxis trials were a couple of years after this, but I'll have to look that up. I'm not entirely sure. But in any case, um, the guy relapsed on MMF. Now, the relapse therapy was correct. Um, you know, this was before Pextivas. This was in the Mepex era. Creatinine was going up. So apheresis was indicated based on the norms of practice at that time. Um, and we were able to place them into some form of remission again. But the critique I would have is if they failed MMF prophylaxis, uh, sorry, maintenance, then putting them back on MMF maintenance may or may not have been a solid idea. And this is 2016. So at this time, we already know that MMF maintenance is maybe not that great. This is, I think, after main Ritsan 1 at least came out. So I would probably have put him on rituximab maintenance. This is MPO disease, not Cianca disease. And so the other question I have is the thinking behind keeping him on immunosuppressive maintenance for five years um, in an MPO disease when antibody levels are negative and there's no activity um, that, I mean, no vasculitic activity that you can judge. It looks like He's got progressive sclerosis of the kidney, and Aurangzeb is right. If you biopsied him now, 
it'll be an end stage kidney. So any treatment that I afford now um, would be directed at extra renal disease. I don't think there's much left in the kidney to salvage. So, um, you know, if there's pulmonary hemorrhage or something, which at this stage should become very, very unlikely. Uh, but if it does happen, then you'd probably need to treat it based on its own merits. And as at his age, uh, probably rituximab would be the way to go um, at that point. Um, I, I don't know if I would want to give him cyclophosphamide. But the, the, the main question I have is why MMF in 2016 and why for an indefinite period of time? Yeah, so the, the, the relapse in 2000, so 2012, he stopped MMF. And then the, the, the relapse in 15 was he was not on MMF. Okay. Um, I think the decision at that time, uh, I, I don't recall, I think maybe the, the second time MMF, I think this was the rheumatology who was engaged as well. Um, and this was one of the discussion and since patient was already on, it was exposed. So, so without any rhyme, I don't have the best answer to it, like why this was chosen again, but I like that. I think this is a good, good critique that uh, why not um, some other forms of maintenance therapy. So I agree with doing biopsy at that time because I want to see whether the patient, how much is left to be treated. But otherwise, if a uh, renal biopsy shows that he doesn't have even close to end stage, I mean, 70, obviously, it's not a very young age, but we have to take in contents that his other comorbidities. If otherwise, he's a good 70-year-old, I don't have any problem in uh, starting cyclophosphamide, which I have done. I mean, at least two or three patients in their 70s, and they did pretty good after that, because obviously those patients did not have and there are significant comorbidities like uh, advanced diabetes or heart failure. But obviously, you have to keep close eye on that, any malignancy or any other complication from cyclophosphamide. Oh, uh, thank you. He's not 79. Yeah, so give him six months now. of cyclophosphamide induction again, Aves? I mean, I what? Yeah, I mean, I, I treated those patients I'm talking about. They were, I was, uh, yeah, I, we gave them patient with PO cyclophosphamide, reduced dose. Oh, he's seventy. So what if that's, the that's kidney not... size is borderline? What if the kidney size is, let's suppose, nine, and uh, grade two echogenicity, let's say? Uh, would you do a renal biopsy in the case? What are the odds of patient bleeding post renal biopsy, and what's the policy in general? Yeah, I, I, I think if I'm, um, I have this similar or same situation again, I, I, and based on your criteria on the kidney, um, on ultrasound, I would not dare to do the biopsy because I can make a mental picture of how his biopsy would look on the, um, uh, under the mic uh, microscope. So, because that, that may not even change much of my management because I think at this stage, if he has another relapse, uh, it might be based on the extra renal manifestations. But yeah, again, that's, that's like an individual, individual opinion. Yeah, on the hypothetical scenario that you post, that uh, the patient may be presented with extra renal manifestations and there is a rise in serum creatinine, let's suppose five to eight with active urinary sediments. In that case, I was just wanting to know, would you do a renal biopsy in that case or even then? You will you will go with your clinical acumen. Um, I again, I think um, I probably would not do the biopsy, but I think let's see. Since this this is an opinion zone, it's not a data zone. It's my own opinion. Um, I I would be happy to take other experts' answer on this. I mean, I'm not an expert, but again, <laughs> uh, my threshold to do biopsy is pretty low uh, because it's pretty safe nowadays. And it give you many information, and sometimes you're surprised to the biopsy finding. Uh, so again, there's no hard and fast rule here. Is uh, nobody is wrong or right? I mean, it depends on your individual, uh, you know, uh, evaluation. Uh, as whole, well, I do biopsy more often than not, because if the patient is in particular the patient in hospital or easy to be done, so because pretty safe, and I have not seen any major complication from kidney biopsy. Thank God for a long time. Okay, so let's let's assume two scenarios, right? 
let's assume this patient comes in for another visit. He's got low grade fevers, he's got fatigue, his proteinuria is now four grams in the urine, he's got some hematuria, and his creatinine is seven. Everything else is fine. What would you do? I mean, you can you lower the creatinine a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> he's five now. So, I mean, he's already end stage, close to end stage. He's a 75 year old. Yeah, you're right. I mean, then you have to see that what you're getting after doing biopsy or actually treating this guy. I mean, so that's, 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 that's the whole point. That's the point that we are trying to make here that based on the kidney, <laughs> to do anything more. Uh, but I'll, I'll give another scenario in a second, which makes things different. But let's dissect this scenario. This may happen next month when he comes in to see Umar. Creatinine is now seven, three, four grams of protein and hematuria. Um, and um, um, so he says, what can you do for me? So what are, Umar, what are you gonna do? Yeah, so, so two things come to my mind. One is that from the, uh, is this progression of his disease, uh, just like natural progression from all the you know damage done in the past and without the active vasculitis or what are my signs and symptoms and criteria uh, or, or markers for active disease? Because if he is have, if he's having another relapse of vasculitis, so that is dangerous for his life if we don't treat that. So sometimes you treat vasculitis not, not just for the kidney, but for the lungs, for, for other reasons. But he's got if, no other symptoms, nothing, just the kidney. It's renal limited, you know. I, I, renal limited. I'm not going to give you wiggle room, my friend. Okay. <laughs> well, that's good. So my, my plan is like, I think um, if, if I see any rise in creatinine, so I, my plan is to consider dialysis on this gentleman because yeah. he's on, on MMF as of now. So if he has a breakthrough um, of rise in creatinine, I think, and there is nothing else to suggest that he has active vasculitis in other organs, I would proceed with dialysis. Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's something to be said if he's got good quality of life, he's not on dialysis, maybe you can give him a short jab of steroids, you could probably give him one dose of rituximab, you know, one cycle of rituximab to see if you can put something down to sleep. But, you know, there's a very good chance, like you said, that he's going to develop secondary sclerosis and he's going to develop worsening proteinuria. His kidney is going down in the next one or two years, in the next one year, maybe he should be on dialysis by all stretches of the imagination. He, and you know, I don't know what his trajectory is, but looking at the trajectory, 2018 creatinine was in the threes, now it's in the fives. So he's gonna end up on dialysis soon. But the situation changes a little bit, right? Now let's suppose same scenario, creatinine is seven, um, proteinuria is four grams, but he's also short of breath and has got ground glass opacities on the CT of the chest. So now you're looking at a lung renal relapse, right? And your equation completely changes in that scenario. And so now what you're going to do is you're going to treat the lungs. You've already forsaken the kidneys. You've done that thought experiment that if this was a renal only relapse, the kidneys are so far gone that you're not going to invest too much in them. Uh, but if it's a lung renal response, then you're not talking about the kidneys. As, long, as soon as you've determined that this is not pulmonary edema and that he's got alveolar hemorrhage, then you have to treat it. And there you have to pull out all the stops. You have to treat it whichever way you think is right. Um, and so if it takes cyclophosphamide, it takes cyclophosphamide. If you want to do steroids or rituximab, that's what it is. Um, you know, plasma freezes in today's time. I'm sure you'll discuss Pexivas as we go along. So we'll kind of have a conversation about that. But um, in that situation, your therapy is squarely, like you were mentioning, uh, focused on extra renal manifestations. So it's on the merit of the lung vasculitis that you would treat it. So in that case, OVS is probably going to end up giving him cyclophosphamide or I might give him um, uh, steroids and rituximab, but we will all agree that this patient would need immunosuppression, but it's only for extra renal disease. At this point, for renal-only disease, not very many people would be very aggressive. <clears throat> And so regarding scenario one, where you uh, had a hypothetical situation, the patient had a worsening protein urea. Once we don't have a glomerular hematuria confirmed and uh, there isn't any another infection, the biopsy for a person like me, uh, nine centimeter or 8.9 centimeter with the ecogen history raised with this history, I may not like to do a renal biopsy for some reasons. These are separate beyond the scope of this discussion. 
Uh, but in these cases, uh, being in USA, do you use CD163 or things like that to predict any activity within the kidneys? Does it help in any way? No, I, I think it's not mainstream. Those are all, you know, uh, being done as research operations, but they're not in mainstream practice at this time. Um, the, the thing is that if it's renal limited disease, I mean, we all know creatinine of five with a 15, 16 year vintage of repeated vasculitic uh, activity, we know there's going to be a lot of scar in that kidney. There's not much to be salvaged. Um, if the guy was completely asymptomatic and this is a dramatic jump, I would probably not biopsy him just because the downside, I mean, what am I going to find? I'm, I'm going to find either some vasculitic activity or just chronic sclerosed disease. So I might give him a little bit of immunosuppression to quieten something down and move on with life. But if there's extra renal disease, then, then I already have that so if, if he's got lung hemorrhage, I know that he's got pulmonary vasculitis again, and the, that changes the equation entirely. I will tell you that I have very rarely seen um, bipolar disease. I mean, when I say bipolar, I mean lung and kidney disease in ANCAs that have gone to advanced state, stages of chronic kidney disease. So lung hemorrhage in patients like this is a not very common event, uh, just because I think with the renal failure, building up and they being on some form of maintenance and this patient is an MMF, I don't think he's going to have a relapse that way. Yep. So, so maybe I think uh, I, if allowed, I would take the opportunity to move to the next segment. So uh, where we present, have a brief presentation about the ANCA associated vasculitis. Um, historically without treatment, one year mortality um, of Wegener's uh, classic, as described in the original studies, was 80%. Um, um, and, and now I think the, the, with the current treatment or recent treatment, the survival is reversed. So one year survival is now 88% and five year is 78%. Um, the, the death is still happening. If this is within a year, active vasculitis, 19% cause of death, infection, 48% cause of death. So, so we have to be careful with, um, um, you know, manage the disease, but also uh, watch for other complications. If the, the frequent cause of death beyond one year is cardiovascular disease, cancer infections. So uh, this is kind of some nomenclature and uh, a big picture view of the uh, 2012 revised uh, Ch Chapel Hill Consensus Conference uh, classification of all these vasculitis. So either this is kind of the large vessel vasculitis, you remember Takayasu in giant cell, or it goes to the medium size. So this is Pan or Kawasaki's disease. Um, when you go to keep going down to the smaller vessels, uh, either there are, there are immune complex small vessel vasculitis or ANCA associated, this one, the posse immune small vessel vasculitis. So immune comp complex are your cryoglobulins, um, HSP, IgA vasculitis, and um, some of those, those uh, complement uh, associated. And anti-GBM is somewhere as, as well. Um, do your ANCA associated or microscopic polyangiitis, um, the granulomatosis with polyangiitis, former Wegener's, and eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis or Churk's Ross. Um, they also looked for um, kind of, you know, some other ways to look at the whole vasculitis um, scenario. So, Either there is a variable vessel, which means it, it can involve different uh, size of vessels, single organ um, in the skin, uh, CNS vasculitis, or just in aorta, um, vasculitis with systemic diseases, lupus, rheumatoid, sarcoid, or vas vasculitis with some other probable etiologies, hep C, B. C is usually associated with cryoglobulinemic vasculitis, syphilis, uh, drug-induced, drug both um, immune complex as well as ANCA associated. I think the hydralazine is, is, is also implicated here, cancer and other uh, conditions as well. So 
Clinically, they may have some constitutional symptoms, fever, malaise, non-specific symptoms, weight loss. Um, if this is ENT manifestation um, with the nasal uh, mucosa, the, the ear as well, some ulcers in the mouth, or lung manifestation, uh, all the way from hoarseness of voice to cough, shortness of breath, stride of wheezing, hemoptysis, pleuritic chest pain, and then um, uh, hallmark is the alveolar hemorrhages. Kidney GN with um, um, hematuria with or without rise in creatinine. So earlier on, we have seen many patients, uh, all they have is glomerular hematuria and mild degree of proteinuria. Um, skin, um, skin lesions could be different, you know, purpura in the lower extremities, around the nails, uh, some focal necrosis as well. And eye and um, um, uh, uh, orbital symptoms as well. Whereas the ANCA associated, as I, as I mentioned, the three conditions, they all have ANCA. Uh, they have um, on the kidney, usually the focal necrotizing or crescentic GN, and this is posseimmune on immuno, immunofluorescence, um, predominantly affecting small vessels. Um, and I think commonly seen in older adults. So, and it's associated with specific myeloperoxidase um, or antiproteinase 3 ANCAs. So uh, pathogenesis, I think uh, we are, uh, and this cartoon, this was from a recent article about, uh, recent publication about the review article. Um, so really, I think we have made some strides in understanding the pathogenesis and it, it's both B and T lymphocytes are involved and eventually neutrophils, as you see here, has this PR3 and MPO and um, this kind of activated neutrophil, it causes the, um, uh, you know, all this, this problem on the vascular uh, endothelium. And then some of the uh, targeted therapies um, are listed here as well. And I think I will cover some of more like bortezomab is really attacking the plasma cells both rituximab and recently, you know, rituximab is FDA approved for this condition. And then this obinutuzumab, it has some data in the lupus world, but there are trials ongoing. These are anti-CD20 drugs. Some of the other monoclonal antibody, this blumimab is also, uh, you know, uh, affecting this uh, BAF, which is the B cell, you know, activating factors. And then uh, one of the complement mediated, um, uh, you know, drug this, Evacopan has a, a trial as well. Let me ask uh, Dr. Aga, I know he explains some of these things way better than any of us. Do, do you have any comments on the pathophysiology or pathogenesis of ANCA-associated vasculitis? Sure. Um, I mean, you, you've, you've done a fantastic job. I don't think I can improve upon that, but I'll just make a couple of points just to kind of drive the point home. Um, so I'll just use your graphic, but you won't be able to see my uh, my pointer. So let's just ignore everything that is to the left of these B and T lymphocytes. Let's just forget about all that for the time being. And just assume for the sake of discussion that NK antibodies are being produced by the body and there could be environmental reasons for that, genetic reasons for that, what have you. So these antibodies, which are here in these green um, Y-shaped forms, are being generated. Now, the next thing that happens is that they need primed neutrophils. So the difference between a resting neutrophil and a prime neutrophil is the prime neutrophil is a little angry and it actually displays PR3 and MPO on its surface. So in this cartoon on the neutrophil, you're looking at these green boxes, which are PR3 and MPO, the blue triangles. They're sitting on the surface of the neutrophil and an active neutrophil will actually move these from inside the cytoplasm to the surface. And this neutrophil activation can happen due to infections like a sore throat or you know, a fever or something else, uh, which just uh, primes those neutrophils because of Th1 cytokines and they produce these, they, they extrude these PR3 and MPO molecules to the surface and that provides the ANCA antibodies a target. So now what happens is that the anti and NK antibodies come in and they attach to this target on the neutrophil membrane. Two things happen after that. One is the neutrophil goes into a burst reaction. And the second thing is 
that you will have complement activation. And those are the areas which we are now looking at. So there's something inside the neutrophil called NET, neutrophil extracellular trap. And this is just, um, I always use the example of spidey webs, like Spider-Man throws out those little webs. These are little webs of DNA material, which trap actually bugs and allow for their opsonization to, to um, molecule to cells that would kill them and eat them. Um, so it's a defense mechanism. But in these patients, there is a problem in removal of nets in a timely fashion. And so now you're seeing extra nets coming out. Nets are incredibly pro-inflammatory. So they actually generate an inflammatory response. And since these activated neutrophils are now tethering on the vessel membranes on the rightmost side of this graphic, you're looking at this neutrophil stuck to the endothelium. It's spitting out these nets and these nets are then causing the vascular endothelium to become activated. Um, more inflammatory cells are triggered in, there's ANCA running around, so more ANCA then attaches to those activated cells, and you have this forward loop of ongoing inflammation on the vessel wall. Um, and that's where the pathology of ANCA-associated vasculitis happens. It's in the small blood vessels, the neutrophils come in, and the neutrophil elastases and gelatinases and all that stuff comes out the histones comes out. And when the histones come out, they actually trigger the, the coagulation cascade. So you have this you know, massive inflammatory process that starts on the vessel wall as well. So the, the histopathological hallmark of ANCA-associated vasculitis is fibronide necrosis because it kills the vessel wall. So when you look at it under Masson's trichrome, you see this red goo inside the vessel wall. And that's because the neutrophils just killed it. And I'm sure um, um, uh, uh, Umar will have some pathology slides. If you don't, Umar, let me know. I've got a couple of pathology slides. I can pull one of my presentations up and we can walk through that. Now, also this net business is now going to start linking what's happening on the rightmost part of this graphic to what's actually happening on the leftmost part, part. And so what happens is that these nets can actually signal through antigen presenting cells to TLR9 and MIDE88, um, and they can actually engage the, the, um, the um, adaptive immune arm, making them uh, go up uh, and make more uh, anti antibodies. So there's a forward feedback loop in producing more antibodies as well. And therefore, that then dictates how we want to treat this. We want to cut off antibody production. So we're looking at cutting it off either through proteasome inhibition, which is your Welcade, bortezomib, or through CD20 depletion, which is your B lymphocytes making antibody. Belumumab, which is now being used very frequently in lupus, is a transitional cytokine inhibitor. So it actually decreases the recruitment of B cell transition and secondary lymphoid organs due to an active immune response. And then, you know, we have um, our usual steroids, et cetera, to dampen down the inflammation itself, and then targeted therapies. Um, through uh, through complement cascade blockers, because that's what's going on on top of the vessel. Most of the damage that's happening is because of is because of the neutrophil stuff and the complement. So it's a it's a very classic small vessel vasculitis. But the interesting thing in this is that the damage that is happening um, is precipitated at a distance. So the neutrophil comes in; it's already primed; it's already got this anti antibodies attached to it, then it comes in and bumps into the vessel wall and starts leading to, the, to this inflammatory damage. So that leads to a very peculiar set of findings on um, kidney biopsy. And when Umar goes over that, we will discuss those. So I'll, I'll give the mic back to you, Umar. No, but thank, thank you. I, I, I think this is, this is best. This is most excellent um, uh, explanation. And I think having this picture in front and then how you explained that was great. So let me ask you and then have all of us think about another fact. Uh, is ANCA a pathogenic antibody? So, so that there's, a, there's a question. I think the, 
um, the clinical scenarios are that, uh, you know, anti-GBM, we know that you monitor the antibody and, you know, there is, there, there is more direct or more clear association with having anti-GBM and the pathogenicity and disease activity on the clinical. You know, we know that PLA2R, for example, has how no, like very clear cut association recently. Now we know more about it with the membranous in the primary. So let me ask, uh, I mean, let's have a discussion about is the ANCA antibody pathogenic? So in the lab, you know, area now we have more and more data that yes, the ANCA is pathogenic. In the clinical scenario, can you use the ANCA titers as a marker of pathogenicity or disease activity? For example, if somebody needs a transplant and they are more than a year late out, but still have a little bit ANCA here and there, or a patient who's are in uh, remission a few years out and they may have the ANCA presence at a low stage. So what's the, what's the jury out there about the ANCA? Let me ask the experts. Let, let, me, let me just modulate that question a little bit more because you're asking two different questions. So the first question is, are ANCA antibodies pathogenic, right? The second question is, does ANCA antibody level correlate with the uh, with uh, disease activity. disease activity yes so those are different questions mm -hmm. so i just wanted to make sure that i pointed that out but yeah I, I, you know i let people win so anybody wants to take um, a shot on this i mean that's what the like a patient who need a transplant patient is in remission for over a year i mean otherwise there's no sign of any activity in that case the protocol at least in our region is that no that is not a reason to hold on or delay his or her transplant although maybe not available now uh, maybe in near future there will be available some more sophisticated tests when you can check some epitopes on that uh, anca which are suggested of activities and uh, if there's not then suggested of like a really quite remission so the short answer at least in our practice is uh, no is uh, ANCA level doesn't need to be monitored in the patient is a complete remission clinically and it should not delay or hold on his or her transplant. We have the same protocol. Aurangzeb, you raised the hand. You want to talk? I think, uh, I think it's very well said. By, that's why I learned by hand because I think whatever uh, Dr. West was saying, I think that explains the whole theory. Um, some other answers. So I think the, um, uh, I know Dr. Aga, he's on, uh, he's probably taking a call. So uh, for the transplant, for the clinical association, you know, really we have the same protocols here as well. But in the, um, so now there, there are some association and some data, especially in the animal models about, you know, you, you inject ANCA um, uh, and or or use some of some of the you know lab techniques, and actually it can lead to um, uh, it's a new disease or relapse of the previous disease. But I think the um, uh, in the clinical world um, the association is still loose, and we are not basing the presence of ANCA to decide um, you know, those transplant decisions. Although there were some trials done which they, they did use the tighter uh, presence and absence to guide the therapy. So, so maybe I think I, I move to the next slide and then we'll probably discuss this once Dr. Rawla is back. So, so pathology wise, um, I, I think we have uh, made this point very clear that there are, there are segmental glomerulonecrosis with crescent formation and uh, you can see on the right hand side there is global necrosis with the circumferential crescent and the the other thing is the segmental fibronoid necrosis with perivascular leukocyte infiltration which i think if you um, just as we learned the pathophysiology it makes absolute sense i think we, we, we uh, dis uh, discussed that point before so this is what this is another um, kind of set of slides in the A, you see that uh, there is active global cellular crescent with segmental necrosis. 
So you can see that the, the crescent is like, like really global. In the B, there is this segmental fibrocellular crescent. I think this is the crescent and this is your normal glomeruli and you also see the fibroid necrosis. In the C on this side, um, there is a fibrous crescent, this one. And I see that, the, uh, sorry, this one and then cells have a lot of activity here too. Uh, on the D, the, there are glomerular in the different stages. So the single arrow shows the active cellular crescent, okay? The um, arrowhead is like really this segmental um, necrotizing lesion. And when you see those um, double arrows, which are uninvolved glomeruli, you can, you can see these are normal, but here you can see all this inflammation and this is, this is far gone. Um, going to the, um, you know, looking at how these histological patterns have impact on um, the, the outcomes and also I think some sort of a classification so you can either has, have uh, more than 50% globally sclerotic glomeruli or more than 50% normal, you call them focal class, or if there are more than 50% has cellular crescent, then you call them crescentic class. And if not, none of these patterns fit, it fits, it's a mixed class. It's really like a, like a stepwise um, upgradation. But you can see that if this is focal, the outcomes are good, but the next bad is the crescentic outcomes. Um, um, the, the next outcome, I think that poor outcomes with the mix and the, if this has far gone to sclerosis, then um, the outcomes are, I think, worse in this um, uh, study. So again, I think this highlights the importance of the, the, the longer the inflammation or severe the inflammation is, it will lead to uh, different stages of diseases and then worse outcomes. So three syndromes and some of the um, uh, you know presentation or some of the association or uh, so GPA uh, like all of these all three has anchor positivity but you can see in GPA and MP MP is your uh, GPA is granulomatosis with polyangiitis MP is your uh, um, um, you know so. Um, they both have 90% anchor positivity, whereas EGPA only have 40%. PR3 is predominantly associated with GPA, whereas MPO is predominantly associated with MP. I always remember MPO, MPA, and this is renal limited. Kidney is the only um, um, organ, whereas GPA, you can have uh, no sinus, lung, kidney, joints, eye, other uh, organs as well. Um, in both conditions, GPA and MPA, you see a lot of renal involvement, whereas in Chugstrasser, which is eGPA, you'd see less of that. Um, and again, I think uh, more than 50% RPGN with GPA and MPA. So from nephrology standpoint, I think the GPA and MPA is what we commonly see. Uh, risk factor for relapse. So if this is PR3 ANCA, it tends to relapse more. If there is lung involvement, again, I think it's the, the hazard ratio is 1.7. Um, and if all of these three things are PR3, lung, upper respiratory, the, the hazard ratio is the highest. So these are the risk for relapse. How do we, um, Irfan, before we go to the treatment, do you want to share your slides for the pathology? You want me to unshare the screen? Uh, you are on mute, I think. Just one second, let me find my presentation. Can you see my slide? Yes, we, we do. Okay, so <clears throat> this is uh, Masson's trichrome. And so blue is scar and red that you see over here is all fibrinoid necrosis. So what you're looking at is this glomerulus over here, and this is a blood vessel. So 
what you're seeing here is this focal, intense focal necrosis. So this is all fibrinoid necrosis. And I'll kind of go into the pattern of that a little bit in the, um, in the next slides. So this is what happens. And we'll kind of go over how a crescent actually forms. On this side, what you're seeing is that the arterial wall is dying. So imagine that those neutrophils were all piled up over here. They were spitting out all sorts of junk to destroy the vessel wall, all sorts of inflammatory um, cytokines and so on and so forth. And then the vessel wall starts dying. And this is the way the vessel, the, the vessel wall cells die by fibrinoid necrosis. So this is what you see in this. This is classically what you will see in NCA associated vasculitis. This is not what you see classically with lupus, for instance, but for NCA, you see this. So now this is, um, this is Joan Silverstein, of course. So let's see what a normal basement membrane would look like. So these are normal capillary loops over here. You can see this. Now what you're seeing over here is this light pink eosinophilic material in the middle. So this is an area which has actually been destroyed, liquefied by the inflammatory process. So this is, this is your fibrinoid necrosis. Now let's follow this basement membrane. Let's see what's going on here. You see that it's coming down here, but then there's no basement membrane over here at all. So what is happening is just as we have this arterial um, destroyed by the, by the fibrinoid necrosis, and this goo is actually spilling out of the lumen into the perivascular space, what you're seeing here is this inflammatory goo break the glomerular basement membrane and start spilling out into the into the urinary space. And that is what then leads to uh, an intense reaction where the parietal epithelial cells start multiplying. And that's what a crescent is. So the definition of a crescent is three or more layer of parietal epithelial cells in the urinary space. So you can see there's layers of these cells and these cells are actually activating because all of this inflammatory fibrinoid necrosis, which you see over here, breaks the basement membrane and draws itself into the urinary space and stimulates the epithelial cells. So that's how crescents form in ANCA associated vasculitis. So if you really look at it, these, this is the classic picture that you'll see. Fibrinoid necrosis break in the glomerular basement membrane and then crescent formation and they follow. So you first get the fibrinoid necrosis, which would be focal. Now, the more you get, the more glomeruli you get in wall tells you that the burden of the disease is high. And that is why ANCA is one disease in which you wanna look at involved glomes, but also on the uninvolved glomes. If you have more uninvolved glomes, then um, you, um, you, um, are going to probably be able to get on top of this and understand the disease that we see as nephrologists and the disease that the rheumatologist sees is very different. We see this because by this time the creatinine has gone up. What the rheumatologists see is um, hematuria and then a little bit of proteinuria and they biopsy the kidney and they say they see a few gloms with focal necrotizing vasculitis and that's why they can get away with methotrexate and mmf when we get into this stage we're not going to get away with that weak t so we need the real deal uh, in these patients so this is an electron micrograph of what you would see in these patients or more importantly, what you won't see. So if you take a stab at this, what do you see and what you don't see is what the pathogenesis of this disease is. So take a look at this. You've got this basement membrane coming around. This is one capillary loop. This is another capillary loop. And over here, the basement membrane is being destroyed here. But what you don't see in this area, and this, the, the, these are red blood cells here, what you don't see in, these, in this mesangial area here is, is any deposits at all. So you're not going to see deposits in NCA associated vasculitis. Um, and this is why your immunofluorescence is dark. And why is that? And it is because this disease is being driven by neutrophils that are already activated. Um, they've got complement sitting on top of them and that complement is already recruiting inflammatory cells. Um, and therefore um, the damage is not through the lytic, um, uh, the membrane lytic um, um, 
uh, complex uh, it is through anaphylotoxins because the membranelytic complexes are actually sitting on the neutrophils, not on mesangial cells or endothelial cells. So the deposits, when we see them, when we see deposits in lupus, what are they made of? They're made of immunoglobulins, IgG, IgA, IgM, and complement. That's what's in those deposits. Uh, but in, in ANCA-associated vasculitis, those things are all on the neutrophils. They are not in the kidney itself. There's no deposition of antigen antibody complexes. There's no complement generation in C2 on kidney tissue. And therefore your immunofluorescence is dark. From time to time, you'll find faint IgG, but that's pretty much what you get. You don't get the immunofluorescence to, to light up. And that's all I have on the pathology. So uh, Umar, I'll, I'll re return this back to you. Thank you. Um, do you see the slideshow that says induction of remission treatment? So, mm -hmm. so treatment, um, I think we, we covered, we touched this a few times today is like, you know, the, the treatment is what can I do to, you know, bring this active disease down right now? So induction of remission. So then the second phase is really how, what can I do to maintain the remission or prevent the relapse. And, and then I think uh, the, the other uh, is how do I treat a relapse? So um, in ANCA associated vasculitis, I think there have been several clinical trials. So I think it's, um, it's important that we, we discuss some of those key major clinical trials to, to understand uh, how we arrived to the current, um, uh, you know, some of the treatment modalities. So uh, the, uh, the, the the classic treatment has been uh, around the use of cyclophosphamide and, and, and steroids. So I think one of the uh, important, this trial, Cyclops trial, uh, 149 patients. Um, um, and then the intervention was pulse um, cyclophosphamide um, every two to three weeks versus oral cyclophosphamide. So there was no difference between oral versus IV pulse. And um, the, there was higher risk of relapse in the pulse arm on long-term follow-up. But again, I think the, there was another follow-up trial which showed the cumulative dose exposure was, was lower than the oral. Then the two classic or, or, uh, trials, one is the, this MEPEX and this followed by the PEXIVAS. So MEPEX was severe ANCA associated GN patient with creatinine was more than five, 100% kidney involvement. And these patients received uh, the, the plasma exchange therapy, PLEX, the control arm received IV uh, methylprednisolone. And then the outcome was renal recovery at three months. At three months, they noted that PLEX was superior and there was no difference in long-term outcomes in this studies. Then uh, there was a follow-up larger studies. And I, and I think before in, in the MEPEX era, we, we actually performed plasma exchange for many patients who fulfilled those criteria. Then there was a Paxivus trial, which had 704 patients. Um, um, and then they had 29% with creatinine was more than 5.7, uh, 98% had renal involvement. So they had uh, plasma exchange with low dose glucocorticoid and then in the other control was the no plasma exchange, but standard dose glucocorticoid. So their primary endpoint was death or end stage kidney disease at 12 months. So there was no difference um, um, uh, in the efficacy and there was no difference in subgroup analysis for ESRD, death or alveolar hemorrhage. So MEPEX showed superiority of the plasma exchange, but when it was followed by Paxivas, there was no difference. Um, anybody uh, wants to have a comment on these? Because there are three or four more trials, I just wanted to make sure that I uh, this is one screen and I go to the other induction trials. Uh, I, I know, Irfan, you talked about the MEPEX and uh, Paxivas in the, in the beginning. Any comment before I go to the next slide? No, I so think MEPEX was the older trial, right? In the smaller trial. Yes, MEPEX was a smaller trial. It was followed by the PEXIVAS. Yes, larger trials. I think MEPEX was 2012. I think uh, PEXIVAS was 2020. 
um, I think Pexivas is remarkable in the number of patients that they recruited. I mean, it is truly mind blowing that they had 700 patients in this trial. Understand that these trials are very, very expensive. Um, the other, I think, important corollaries. I mean, the question of of plasmapheresis, even after Pexivas, is sometimes open. All the routine plasmapheresis in patients with ANCA associated vasculitis is probably not um, supported now after after Pexivas. But even late last year, there was a subgroup. Um, of patients with crescentic disease and pulmonary alveolar hemorrhage, which maybe had a signal towards better outcomes. So people who want to use plasmapheresis in very sick patients will find a way to do that. And I know of clinicians who do it. Now I'll, I'll give you a very quick clinical anecdote uh, in a sec. Uh, but for most patients, uh, this is not probably supported now. Now, the other important thing that comes out with Paxivas is like in all diseases that we are seeing now, we're beginning to move away from the industrial strength plus uh, prednisone doses that we've been using in these patients. So another sometimes often overlooked subgroup uh, analysis or you know arms that uh, we discussed in, um, in um, these patients is the low steroid group. And they actually did, the low steroid group did um, almost, I mean, actually exactly as well as the high steroid group. So I think some of these very high pulses and very high dose steroids for long periods of time, I think we can we can start cutting back on after Pexivas because our other treatments are so effective now. High dose steroids like this open-endedly are legacy from the 70s and 80s when we really didn't have much other stuff going on. And one of the cardinal roles in which avocapone is being, is being positioned which is a complement 5A inhibitor, is, um, is to spare steroids so that we can get away from you know, using these very awful drugs for long periods of time. Um, now, the patient I would present is uh, a 30-year-old previously healthy woman. This is a real patient, so I'm gonna just, uh, I don't have it written down. So she came to the hospital with hematuria, proteinuria, acute kidney injury, she had fever and fatigue, and she went to her doctor, and all hell broke, broke loose. Her creatinine was like five. Um, her NCA antibodies were very high. It was a CNCA driven disease. And um, we biopsied her, and she had 100% crescents. Every glom had a crescent, and she had pulmonary hemorrhage. So, you know, once uh, I, I'm sure you're going to go on to rave and rituximabs and all that. So everybody think about this patient. And then once we have done all the induction trials, then we'll see what kind of induction would we give to this young lady who had no problems and now is an RPGN with 100% crescents on her biopsy. So the next uh, uh, group of uh, important, I think, again, like there are some other trials as well, but then I think RAVE. So these are still, the, we are still on the induction trials. So RAVE has 197, both new and relapsing patients. Uh, and this is the rituximab trial, which is 375 milligram per meter square for four weekly doses. And the control arm was uh, PO cyclophosphamide followed by azathioprine, the classic treat treatment. So uh, the remission, which is, you know, there's a BVAS scoring system. Uh, this was zero and completion of um, uh, steroid taper at six months. So there was no difference. So, so this RAVE actually was better for relapsing disease. So in summary, RAVE, they compared rituximab with cyclophosphamide and it was non-inferior, even actually better for relapsing disease. So now you have a good alternative uh, from the RAVE trial. Then there was this Retux VAS, which had 44 patients and um, it used um, the, the, the Retuximab for uh, same four weekly doses plus IV cyclophosphamide 15 milligram per kilogram for two doses. And the control arm was IV cyclophosphamide for six to 10 doses followed by azathioprine. And this showed that uh, in the sustained remission, there was no difference. So, so in this trial, there was a combination of rituximab and IV, IV cyclophosphamide. More recently, 
Uh, another major trial, this, they, they call it Advocate 331 patients. In this trial, this new drug, Avacopan, as Dr. Ala mentioned, this is a, this is a complement drug. This uh, with, with rituximab or cyclophosphamide and the control arm was prednisone with rituximab or cyclophosphamide. Um, and in the in with this use of this drug the, in the clinical remission, um, there was no difference. And in the sustained remission, again the the new drug which is avacopan, is, which is superior. Um, uh, Irfan, do you want to say something about um, these three trials, or any other trial you want to touch base? Yeah, sure. I mean, just just you know, just a couple of editorial comments on Rave. Um, note that in the rituximab arm, there's no maintenance. So, you, you know, they get, get the four doses of rituximab, then they are not on ASA. They're on nothing. So they, they just get the steroid taper and they get the rituximab and they're done. And yet rituximab was better for relapsing disease in this trial. So that's a remarkable um, long-term efficacy um, uh, indication uh, for rituximab in this disease process. Um, also, look at the entry criteria for RAVE. They actually excluded patients with a creatinine of more than four. So sometimes I see these patients who are on dialysis and we say, okay, let's treat them with RAVE. Actually, RAVE didn't answer that question. Rituxvas, on the other hand, did answer that question. They did take pa people with uh, higher degrees of renal dysfunction. They did take patients um, on dialysis. And uh, therefore, you know, we have to be mindful when we are prescribing therapy in patients who are very, very sick. And thirdly, advocate, you know, this is, this is the up and coming um, uh, form of therapy for, for, for NCA associated vasculitis. And again, um, you, you look, at the, look at the arms and you, you're taking a vocopan instead of prednisone. So you're trying to get rid of prednisone here. Um, and also there's a, there's a couple of very recent articles that are looking at C3 levels in ANCA-associated vasculitis and the subgroup of ANCA-associated vasculitis patients who are low C3, there's a subgroup of that, they are probably the most likely to have a salutary response to, to um, avocopan. So. Thank you. So, uh, if I could ask, ask a question. Mm -hmm. now, regarding RAVE, um, what was the time duration for the remission? Because uh, plasma cells don't have CD20, and uh, it seems to be an angry disease where the plasma cells are firing the ANCA. Mm -hmm. So in that case, uh, I understand the later remission in case of membranous nephropathy due to the disease. Sure. What was the disease remission time versus cyclophosphamide, that's question number one. Mm -hmm. And the second question is even more naive, and that is uh, regarding Pexivas, there wasn't any uh, use of rituximab and cyclophosphamide in both the arms, right? Uh, uh, say, say that again, RMC. In Pexivas trial, there wasn't any use of cyclophosphamide or rituximab. In Pexivas? Yeah, in Pexivas, there was only plasma Phrases versus uh, no plasma. No, 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 no. The plasma, no, no, no. standard treatment for that. No, no, the plasma. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. We 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 stopped doing that kind of stuff after Tuskegee. No, there there was standard treatment. Plasma yeah. phrases was uh, added on or not. So let me. So in Pexivas there were four groups. Um, the N was seven. I, I just pulled up my presentation. So okay. The groups in front of those. I'm not going to share this slide. I'll just tell you. So there was pulse steroids. So the groups received either rituximab or cyclophosphamide. Um, and then the four groups were plex, no plex, full dose steroids, um, and low dose steroids. So that's kind of the group. So everybody either got rituximab induction or cyclophosphamide induction. All right. And uh, what about the uh, treatment uh, remission in case of uh, rave? Yeah, let me see if I've got that somewhere. I think it was a good month. But, but b b basically, let me make a point. Um, you know, so your 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 assumption um, behind the question, if I may, if I may venture, be bold to venture to that, is that rituximab is not going to touch the plasma cells, right? 
and that that's a valid that's a valid um, assumption because plasma cells um, do not have CD20. They lose CD19 and CD20, well, mostly CD20 early, and then late plasma cells would lose CD19 as well, and so they would be immune to CD20 or CD19 manipulation. But it depends on the phenotype of the plasma plasma cell of how long they would last. So long-lived plasma cells, uh, which are uh, CD38 positive, CD138 high, CD19 low, um, they can last for decades. So when you get measles shots as children, um, or if you contract measles, you can find that antibody in your blood for decades. And these are the long-lived plasma cells that live in the bone marrow which keep producing that antibody. But the antibody that is produced in different inflammatory reactions, so in NK-associated vasculitis, the antibody that is produced is by a different phenotype of plasma cells, and they are active. They are tissue-resident plasma cells, and they are active for weeks, uh, but not years. And so the theory is that if you deplete the B cells, um, then the B cell graduation towards memory cells and plasma cells will be interrupted and eventually you'll run out of antibody. So um, um, I don't anticipate a huge difference in time to response um, in, in rituximab versus cyclophosphamide. But um, as Umar continues with the talk, let me see if I've got that somewhere. I doubt that I do, but I'll try to find it. Does that sort of answer your question? I think the Definitely time for remission was nine months, right? Everything. Yeah, but that's, I think the, the thing is it didn't differ significantly in, yeah. in both the arms. I've got the time to CD19, uh, sorry, uh, B cell depletion count. So we check it through CD19. That was obviously a little bit faster in rituximab than it was in, in, in controls. Uh, Dr. West said it's nine months. Yeah, to go to mission. No, it should be faster than that. I guess it should well, be. In case of nine months, I think it will check the nerves of the physician too. No, no, because... no. Usually, usually you get into remission around the three month mark. Um, so yeah, every time too. Yeah. So as, mm. actually, uh, Umar, why don't you continue and let me pull up Rave. I don't have the the time to remission. I'll try to find that while you are talking. Yeah, I, I, I think I remember it was not nine months, it was less than that. It was within the, uh, you know, less than six months, but I think it would be good that if you pull that. So so I think this was just like, you know, um, I kind of knew that by, by this time we will have the uh, discussion that we will want to see the time um, line for the trials as well. On the top part is the induction trials on the lower is the maintenance um, uh, trials. And I think here you can see that how the norm MAPEX were back in 2005, 2007. And then this is Cyclops 2009, Grave Retax, as we check, discussed this 2010. And then there are some uh, long-term data as well. And then more recently, this advocate trial, which I just, just present. And there are, there are some, and this was actually, like, this was taken from a, um, uh, rheumatology journal. So maybe I think the other uh, presenter did not ha have this as a part of their um, um, publication. Whereas you can see that simultaneously, the maintenance of remission, which are um, below the timeline arrow, so Psychazerum, the, the Begnet, the improved trial remain, and then this main RITSAN, which is one, two, and then now three as well. So I will discuss some of these um, in my follow-up slides. Uh, so Irfan, please let me know whenever you want to me to unshare, but I will go to the uh, maintenance no, uh, therapy, continue. therapy continue. trial. So maintenance therapy trials, I think, I think it would be good to know that, uh, you know, as in the beginning, we all discussed and, and the, the point was made that the azathioprine is um, has been, I think, the drug of choice for, um, uh, and then better than even the MMF. And I think in my quest, in my patient, I, the, the question was, why did we not choose azathioprine? So let's see. So cyclozarum, uh, 155 patients, um, 
this was the induction was oral cyclophosphamide. The intervention was azathioprine. Control was oral cyclophosphamide as well. And the endpoint was relapse at 18 months. There was no difference. So this was so so brought the idea of using this drug in place of the uh, cyclophosphamide. Um, and then I think um, uh, I, one of the other uh, outcome we found that the MPA relapses less frequently than GPA. So then um, there are some other trials, but I think the, this this the series of this main RITSAN, which involves the rituximab as the maintenance therapy. So we have the option to use either azathioprine. Um, and as Dr. Aza mentioned, there are, if this is like extremely mild disease, then methotrexate. And I think there was a trial as well, which is not included, at least in this slide. So, so then in this main RITSAN uh, trial, 70% uh, with kidney involvement. So induction was the pulse cyclophosphamide. So this was intervention was rituximab 500 milligram day 0, 14, and then every six months. Um, I, I, and then the control was the azathioprine because we, we knew that azathioprine works in the maintenance for one year followed by a taper. Uh, they looked at the relapse at 28 months and found that rituximab was superior in preventing um, the relapse. Um, and then I think um, uh, there were uh, an analysis which showed that relapse occurred after the, when the B cell starts to return. So this led to, okay, can we do some sort of a tailored therapy? So then this main RITSEN, they have the 162 patients. The induction agent was cyclophosphamide or rituximab, or I think, I, I don't know about this methotrexate, there, there are double strexes, but so the they instead of using this fixed dose um, uh, rituximab, there were tailored rituximab, and tailored was these one sixty two patients. So, um, which was one five hundred milligram dose if there is more than two fold increase in the anchor titers. So based on the anchor titers, or there was anchor positivity from negativity or peripheral B cell return. And rituximab was given until 18 months after randomization, and they looked data at 28 months. Um, and they said, like, you know, the tailored therapy still worked. There was no difference. Um, there was no difference in the adverse outcomes, and there were fewer rituximab doses in the tailored arm. So then they went on to this third main RITSEN trial with 97 patients from the main RITSEN number two trial. Um, they had the same induction agent. Uh, and then these patients got a rituximab 500 milligram every six months for 18 months. So versus placebo, so nothing. Uh, and then they looked at um, relapse-free survival at 28 months. Um, so they found that with the extended treatment, there was less uh, relapse. Uh, and again, I think GPA was the condition which has had more relapses. So really they started using the... Um, uh, Cycle, uh, the rituximab in, uh, as compared to azathioprine and then came up with a tailored regimen versus a prolonged and extended regimen uh, and found that when you go to this prolonged regimen, there was less relapses. There are some other um, uh, trials as well for the maintenance therapy, uh, Rita Zaram, which is one to 70 patient. Um, and then these patients who had induction with rituximab and got rituximab one gram every four months for 20 months as compared to azathioprine and then uh, uh, rituximab was superior in this trial as well. Improved trial, 156 new patients, uh, patient with anchor associated vasculitis, uh, induction with cyclophosphamide, maintenance, the intervention was was azathioprine, I think this was the older trial as compared to MMF for one year. And then uh, relapse-free survival uh, was looked at and relapse were more common with MMF. And that's why the azathioprine was considered superior to MMF based on this trial. And there's another important trial called Previs, one of five patients. Uh, and in this trial, this was a Belumubab trial with placebo and azathioprine. And uh, again, there's, this is no difference trial. Um, 
um, uh, and no, no relapses were noted in patients who got rituximab to begin with, and then they received this new uh, belimumab uh, maintenance therapy. So these were, uh, any comments on the main, maintenance from my panel experts? Um, any, any drug which uh, stands out to you or any uh, concluding remarks? Yeah, so I'll just make a couple of points if nobody else is making a point. And that is that when you're looking at relapse potential, when you're plotting your scheme to do maintenance therapy, you have to look at C anca disease and T anca disease as totally different. Um, so C anca are aggressive as far as relapses are concerned. You have to be more careful. You have to be more um, aggressive. Uh, P anca not so much. So when I'm dealing with a C anca um, syndrome, I put them on suppressive treatment for two years, sometimes three years. Um, and what I do is I do fix suppressive treatment for two years, and then I might give them another year. And I use rituximab almost exclusively now for um, maintenance. And for the third year, I may, I may do a CD19 driven um, uh, treatment regimen. Whereas um, in PNK disease, uh, which is well controlled, I might go to a CD19, CD19 driven um methodology from the get-go. So uh, that decreases the amount of immunosuppression that I give to the PNK patients. And I think uh, helps in channeling immunosuppression to people who actually would really need it uh, to avoid a relapse. Yes. <clears throat> I also, at least I remember two patients who were MPA or PNK and they went to remission quickly and the remission remained and we actually took off from the uh, maintenance therapy after one year. Uh, so sometimes you're very, very, I mean, remission is completely completed one year. And then you can think about, particularly if they are NPO or PNK, stopping early maintenance therapy. So I, I just saw a patient this a couple of days ago, I think he's just discharged. So. Uh, 79 years old, very healthy uh, gentleman who six months ago got a biopsy, anca associated vasculitis, um, treated with cyclophosphamide, and there was a plan to switch him on, I think, September 30th to um, uh, azathioprine, and um, he came to hospital on September 28th with um, uh, hemorrhagic cystitis and cross hematuria. So, um, complication of uh, uh, I think we, we thought it's a complication of cyclophosphamide that he developed this hematuria. So we also have to be uh, aware of some of the complications from these drugs. Okay, so this was a one of the, and I think I have two or three slides left. Um, this was the ANCA algorithm uh, by UNC in um, 2017. Um, and I think on the left-hand side, they say their approach was mild or moderate kidney failure with, without pulmonary alveolar hemorrhage. So the, the, the options were methylprednisolone and pulse IV cyclophosphamide or rituximab with prednisone for 16 to 20 weeks to achieve the remission, you go down um, and then maintenance with azathioprine or rituximab and after 12 to 18 months um, in remission, maintenance immunosuppression may be discontinued with close follow-up. Now, if there is severe disease um, at that time, and again, this is 2017, they, they use plasma phoresis, although um, we, uh, I, I think in the timeline we thought, we, we looked at the, uh, uh, the follow-up PLEX trial, which did not show any difference. So there's a difference in, in the old times. I'm just kind of uh, reminding all of us. So then treatment resistance, if you see that, then um, uh, if initially you use rituximab, add cyclophosphamide uh, and vice versa. Um, um, uh, and I think they, they use it for four months um, and to achieve the remission. And if somebody has a relapse, then um, um, uh, everything was an open game. So the, um, the recent, I think this was, this is just published in 2000, uh, like uh, very recently in, in a rheumatology journal. So their approach is 
uh, if there's a diagnosis of severe GPA or MPA, induction of remission with the, you consider high dose glucocorticoids, um, the pulse, IV pulse, followed by oral glucocorticoids, um, or I think they, they want to use um, uh, as the steroid sparing regimen as avacopan with either rituximab and or like or cyclophosphamide. And I think the regimens are, are listed. And I think the uh, they, they still consider plasma exchanges, seven treatments in 14 days. And I'm sure there are some criteria listed. Um, and uh, there is this new concept of rapid reduction of blue cort corticoids, which I think Dr. Aga mentioned, even there were um, some of the trials had those dosage listed, like, you know, you see a response, you go rapid reduction. So there, there is a big push or a movement to try to be steroid sparing and use a therapy which is less toxic. And I hope that in future we go to more targeted therapies which are really um, attacking um, some um, known molecules. Um, and then I think in this, um, the same article, the remission, the maintenance of remission at least two years, um, I think they talked about the low-dose glucocorticoid, and I think we are probably waiting for some of those results for upcoming trials. Um, the options for maintenance, rituximab, consider as first line, uh, uh, 500 to 1,000 milligram every four to six months, uh, mm -hmm. or is a thioprene, or I think methotrexate is still popular in the rheumatology colleagues, I know some of my colleagues, they still want to do, and this is, I think in the article was the um, less severe disease. If above are contraindicated, uh, then they are okay with use of MMF, uh, very high dose. Um, and I think there was a trial about leflunamide as well, if you cannot use any of those uh, uh, therapies above. And um, this is my last slide. So, so this is where we stand in the rheumatology world, in the nephrology world, and we summarize all the trials. So can I stop share and then we can have some discussion? I see some chat questions as well. I, I'm, I'm sure I missed those. Anything in the chat, Dr. Aga, which uh, we need to address? There's a question by Dr. Rabia Azmat. Um, well, ANCA antibody titers are to be correlated with the signs and symptoms. So I think she, this was probably from the time where we were saying whether ANCA is, sorry, I had to take a call from the ER at that time. So I missed part of that discussion. Um, but anyways, okay. Okay, I have a question. Can I go ahead? Yes, yes, please go ahead. Okay, so back to the same discussion about uh, plasma fluorosis in a severe disease. <clears throat> so it, it takes a big trial like rituxivas to not to give plasma fluorosis in a patient who comes with the hemoptysis or severe presentation. Uh, even then, I'm sure a lot of nephrologists don't feel comfortable not giving that treatment. Uh, uh, if I you present the, just talk about a patient to very young and very severe presentation. So did you end up giving her uh, plasma fluorosis? So what would people do? So let me just recap that 30s, previously healthy, RPGN, creatinine in the fives, 100% crescents on the biopsy and CN card driven disease. What would you do? I've asked, what would you do? So 30 years old female, married, unmarried? I don't remember, sorry. Uh, I mean, fertility potential or desire to get pregnant. She's 30, I mean, so I mean, you have to assume that there would be there would be some... some question, question, question is that whether to give plasma fluorosis or not. I mean, definitely I will give that because well, I will... Before, before we go that, what is the induction regimen that yeah, you... The, what, what's I, mean, I would do what? rituximab. I would do rituximab on this patient. You would do rituximab on somebody with a creatinine of 5 and 100% crescents. Okay, not not unreasonable. With, with plasma fluorosis and 30 year old year. You would what? With plasma fluorosis. With plasma fluorosis, okay. Well, what, what would you do? Yeah, I think the, um, from, so the, this is where the cash 22 is. I think her age, her fertility potential. Um, what is the dose of, of cyclophosphamide at which fertility potential is actually an issue? 
I don't know answer to that question. That's a, that's a very good question. But those that so that was my you, you know general framework work of consideration. Yeah, that those normally I know that uh, cyclophosphamide is going to give me quick and uh, um, uh, early response. Um, but I think I'm I I, I don't Does know. It. So I was looking up um, the answer to to Aurangzeb's question. Um, and actually the rave paper and the supplemental material don't parse it out. They gated the data at six months. So they looked at the primary endpoint, which is, you know, emission at six months. So they don't really tell us which one got there fast or faster. So uh, one thing that I find fascinating about rave is uh, with the rituximab four doses, they did not give any steroids. Am I right? No, they did give steroids. They did? Yes, both the arms got steroids. Okay. And yeah, but one of one of the conditions was that the steroids had to be tapered down to, I think, a dose of five to 10 by three months or something like that. And both of them? Yes. Both of the groups? Yes. Okay. With rituximab, uh, the thing is, if uh, the things go just too slow, in membranous nephropathy, you know, it's a simmering disease, and proteinuria tends to get low, and uh, you can counsel the patient that it's going to get better. But if the patient is having a uh, high serum creatinine, the patient is going nuts that I may be going towards the dialysis, and there is so much of panic. So the time duration and the expectations of the patient and the physician needs to be tailored if we're using rituximab to treat an anca vasculitis. And this is a problem that I faced. I have used rituximab in anca associated vasculitis. But generally, uh, our anecdotal experience is because there was only less than a dozen of patients and we are still gathering data about them. Cyclophosphamide worked a lot better in all the patients who had a serum creatinine of greater than four in general. And uh, regarding the hypothetical question that you posed, I think it's a practical question, 30-year-old female, probably I will also give uh, rituximab in that patient. Okay. In that patient for acute therapy, you need something acute to, to I mean, bring down the immunosuppression. You already given first dose steroids. You already given cycle, I mean, plasma phoresis. And that's why I would like to avoid the cycle. She has, she has 100% crescents. So then I don't think that will make any difference between cyclophosphamide and rituximab. Yes, yeah, so essentially what we used was a rituximab based regimen, not the rave regimen, because we thought that this kidney would be at very high risk for permanent damage if we are not hitting her very hard initially. So she was given pulse steroids um, and then an oral steroid uh, maintenance for four months, I think, and then she was tapered down to five and stopped. She received um, two doses of cyclophosphamide, uh, one gram each, three weeks apart, based on the rituxvas protocol. And then she got induction with um, rituximab, two doses. And we did freeze her uh, because this, we thought, was the kitchen sink time. We had one shot at this kidney and we decided to take it because she didn't have a lot of interstitial fibrosis, but in a glomerular disease, that doesn't matter because the interstitial fibrosis follows glomerular sclerosis disease where the damage comes from the top down. Um, so the scene was based on what study? Uh, so this was based on rituximab. The rituximab protocol. Yeah. yeah, so this was the rituximab oh, protocol. That showed that uh, in that condition, patient creatinine is that high, there's a Yes, because, because, because in RAVE, they didn't have a lot of patients with crescentic disease. They didn't have patients with creatinines more than four. And only a quarter of the patients had alveolar hemorrhage. He didn't have alveolar hemorrhage. He just had renal limited disease. Um, and so, and then we did plasma exchange on her. Uh, she got three or five sessions. And so this was in December, I think, of last year. And her creatinine today is 1.2, and she's got about 600 milligrams of protein. So she had a complete response, almost a complete response. But this, okay. is, anecdotal. this is anecdotal. Right. So uh, regarding a hypothetical question, uh, let's suppose a patient of gout develops an anchor associated vasculitis, and he is on alloperinol. Sure. So 
uh, what would you do with allopurinol in this case? Uh, is it safe to convert into febroxostat? Is it just the deficiency of data that is compelling us to convert it, or would you hold that and put on colchicine for a while and see? I, I switch them to pegloricase. So I, I take away the I, them too? Uh, pegloricase. So I, I okay. just I just completely avoid the uh, xanthine oxidase arm. Well, so, let's suppose we're not in Dallas of... and here in services hospital where do we don't have that. Uh, how should we do that? You should then try Euloric and see if that works. I do not know if Euloric has ever been directly associated with NCA associate, uh, generation of NCA. Allopurinol is uh, other medicines that you always want to worry about, especially if you're seeing NCA associated vasculitis or double positive vasculitis, where your N is positive and NCA is positive is uh, hydralazine, antithyroid medicines, and in the United States, especially, I'm sure Pakistan as well, if somebody's using cocaine, because the levamisol in the cocaine, um, which is, um, you know, they, they, it's an adulterant, um, and that, that can lead to generation of uh, any kind of bodies. And so what about cutiapine? It has also been reported to be associated with uh, something like that. I, Have you seen I have not had any experience with cotiapine associated and associated vasculitis, but we have to be careful in not going after onesies and twosies uh, because you can be on cotiapine. A lot of people are on cotiapine and you can develop an NCA associated vasculitis. So you start getting a signal. If I see 10 case reports, then I say, oh, there's something there. Otherwise it might just be an association and not a causal link. Right. So my question, Irfan, is still a health question. So a patient comes to you now who is a, with the pulmonary hemorrhage, creatinine 4, 5, with vasculitis, uh, CNCA. <clears throat> would you give a plasma phoresis or you will not give this? You know, I, you know we, we, we did plasma phoresis in that particular patient just because I thought that I had one shot at that kidney. But if I see focal necrotizing vasculitis, a few crescents, a little bit of pulmonary hemorrhage, that's what the PEXIVAS trial actually told us, right? That in those patients, plasma phoresis really doesn't make a difference. So in those patients, I don't do plasma phoresis anymore. This patient I presented as, you know, oh my God, you know, this kidney's gonna be dead yeah, if I don't, if I don't do whatever I can. It's a young kid. And so I, I did what I could. Um, so that's where sometimes your practice is, and sometimes we do things which are not 100% kosher based on data. So if, if you really critique that based on Pexivas, the, the, the reason I actually succumbed to that, because one of my partners was taking care of the patient, it was a Sunday, I distinctly remember that. So we were talking about it, and I was actually on a conference, uh, there was an ACR conference, an ACR update going on, and it was just serendipitous that they came up with this abstract and they said, in a Paxivas subgroup analysis, people with RPGN, high crescents, and a significant alveolar hemorrhage, there was a signal that phoresis may have helped actually. So it said, well, I've got something to stand on, let's go with phoresis as well. But yeah, with the, the case that you're, you're hypothesizing of S, um, I would probably do phoresis in today's time. So, you know, you, you'll probably violate that rule in one case or the other where there's some, something which looks terribly wrong. But for the most part, if, you've seen, if you're seeing somebody with focal proliferative, uh, sorry, focal necrotizing vasculitis, a few crescents, creatinine is in the twos, threes, fours, um, they've got some alveolar hemorrhage. Um, those are the patients which would probably respond just as well to a strongly constructed induction regimen. So we have a good question by Dr. Hina in the chat. Um, I think we should we should try to. Uh, have, uh, it's a good patient, Dr. Hina. Are you able to present this patient yourself, or you want me to summarize? Is she still here? This one name. Okay, yes. So, so could you could you please uh, tell us about your patient, yourself? Uh, 
Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I have recently encountered a woman aged 64 and uh, she was known case of diabetes for past 20 years and she was on oral anti-diabetic drugs and uh, uh, her diabetes was well controlled and she was uncom uncomplicated diabetes. And uh, she recently presented with the fever with mild cough and one episode of hemoptysis followed by decreased urine output. She was presented at a private setup and uh, where her workup was done. At the time of presentation, her renal function was deranged and her creatinine was around uh, eight or nine. And at that time, her uh, urine was showing active sediments and uh, she was initiated on hemodialysis. And her workup was done at that time where her ANA was positive and her uh, double standard DNA and complements were negative. Uh, also, her ENA profile, profile shows the anti SCL70, which was positive, and her P anchor was a strongly positive 3 plus, and her C anchor was weakly positive. So, um, after, uh, after doing her hemodialysis and her creatinine letting down, her kidneys were normal, so renal biopsy was done. And renal biopsy was showing 14 gloms, uh, renal biopsy was showing 24 gloms, out of which 14 was globally sclerosed. And there was mild to moderate tubular atrophy, as well as interstitial inter inflammation was mild to moderate. And uh, IMF, IMF was totally negative. And um, um, so there was sir, in, uh, sir, some RBC in the vessels. And uh, as in the conclusion, they wrote that it is a chronic sclerosing gene, uh, sorry, focal necrotizing gene. And uh, active or heel lesions are present, along with hemolytic uremic syndrome. So after biopsy report, uh, somebody has given her a uh, methyl pulse, 500 milligram for three days. And also um, her uh, plasma phoresis was initiated and total six sessions of plasma phoresis was done. And along with that, her hemodialysis were uh, continued uh, every third day. And uh, after six sessions of hemodialysis, she was put on oral steroids as well as on oral indoxin. Um, oral cyclophosphamide. And after three to four days, she presented to another nephrologist who stopped her endoxin, uh, oral cyclophosphamide, and uh, told, uh, told her that she is a case of CKD and she has to continue with her hemodialysis. And uh, she was put on low dose steroid along with the conservative treatment of uh, chronic kidney disease. So considering this, I was in confusion whether to stop her immunosuppression at this time why not to continue her cyclophosphamide or redox at present? She is only 15 to 16 days has passed from her recent illness. And we have, uh, we have 14 gloms was globally sclerosed, but 10 were normal. So why, what would be the next step for management in this patient? Whether to continue with immunosuppression or whether to continue with low-dose steroid? Um, Anything else you want to ask? So I think this is good, good description. So um, um, my expert panel members or anybody, do you want to? What, yeah, just how would you? Question come? about this um, HUS that was thrown in the middle. Yeah. What was that about? I didn't get some clarification. Dr. Hina, could you please tell us what they meant by the HUS? Because HUS is actually not a biopsy diagnosis; it's a clinical syndrome. So did they see thrombotic microangiopathy on, uh, on the biopsy? Is that why they're calling it, quote unquote, HUS? Um, sir, there was something showing in the vessel. Uh, there was some activity in the vessels. On that behalf, they have told that it is, uh, in the conclusion, they have written that there is uh, HUS as well. But on clinical parameter and on lab exam, uh, on uh, CBC report, uh, on peripheral smear, there was no sign of uh, HUS like schistocytes or any um, active RBCs, like matlab, yeah. Yeah. any. So I, I think what they're looking at is necrotizing vasculitis and, and some thrombotic microangiopathy. And so they probably inartfully phrased it as HUS, but both these things obviously are very, very well described in NCA associated disease as well. So it looks like this is more consistent with NCA related or PN related mm -hmm. syndrome. Um, so I think the question is open for everybody. Uh, what would you do, guys? 
Yeah, um, I would treat, I would continue to treat with the induction therapy as it was originally started with cyclophosphamide and, and pregnancy patient already completed plasma exchange. This is one of the condition, even if when patients are in acute renal failure uh, and or on dialysis, and I think you, you showed that um, 14 out of 24 are glomeruli are gone, but there are a few which are showing cellular crescents, not, you know, uh, so, so I think there is active disease and maybe in the varial, various, you know, um, stage of the disease. So I, I think we should keep going with the induction therapy. Um, uh, if patient needs dialysis or dialytic support, please continue to provide that and, and wait for some time and give it some time for um, the induction regimen to show its results. Yeah, I think I will probably do the same. I think immunosuppression should be offered and the benefits and the risks of course should be explained to the patient and uh, uh, the patient should be the part of the diagnosis and treatment. And second, if the SCL70 was positive, <clears throat> How does that fit into the equation? And uh, uh, there is a trend towards steroids not being so good for a patient of SCL70 positive. For a patient like that, uh, does it mean anything that we should be tapering steroids a little earlier? And continue yes, with, sir, uh, but with negative immunofluorescence on the biopsy, you have to hypothesize that the antibody that is driving the illness is the ANCA antibody. So your treatment is probably going to direct towards the ANCA antibody, and we would probably ignore the ANA or SEL70 because they don't seem to be pathogenic at this time. Okay. Um, you know, that's kind of how I would look at it. <clears throat> All right. Yeah, so bottom line is that I agree. The patient should be continued the PO cyclophosphamide with reduced dose from because of her renal failure and uh, steroids for some time. And after that, uh, she should be on. Uh, she, she she's should be on, probably going to be left with significant chronic kidney disease, but she may come off of dialysis mm -hmm. for you know six months, one year, two years, which is precious for a sixty-four year old. And you can actually prepare for a preemptive transplant in that period of time as you keep her off of dialysis. So I, I think it's worth treating. Um, I wouldn't take that treatment off. Uh, we take people off of dialysis all the time who need dialysis as a bridge while our immunosuppression fixes the kidney. So I think I wouldn't be hasty in stopping the immuno immunosuppression in this patient. So one thing that we sometimes see as Umar puts up the next case is this double positivity issue. We've kind of talked about that a little bit um, with drugs, but sometimes you see a false positive signal uh, when you've got high dose ANA. So when you've got, uh, sorry, not high dose, high level ANA. So somebody's got high level ANA in the blood and you do an ethanol prep screen, which is what they use for the indirect immunofluorescence for ANCA. So understand there's two different ways you commonly check for ANCA. One is the screening test, which is the indirect immunofluorescence, which is uh, immunofluorescence on an ethanol prep slide. Uh, and the other is by an ELISA for the two major antigens, screening for the two major antigen targets that we look for, the TR3 and MPO. So if you've got high level ANA in the blood and you're doing an ethanol prep, that high level ANA is going to stick in the cell and actually give a false positive ANCA signal, which usually is in the PNCA formation. So if you've got high dose ANA and you've got an indirect immunofluorescence, which is reporting PNCA, then you want to absolutely run the PR3 and MPO ELISAs before you say the ANCA is really positive, it may just be driven by the ANA. So I was thinking about that when we looked at this case, obviously you don't have PR3s and MPOs, but the fact is your immunofluorescence in the kidney, unless that's a false negative immunofluorescence, but the immunofluorescence in the kidney is negative. So I tend to believe that the ANCA is real. So uh, Dr. Irfan, let's suppose if this patient had uh onion skin layering or in the vessels in the last of the 10 glomeruli with SCL70 positive. Sure. Uh, what would you do then? 
that would be a totally different case scenario then this won't be the anka case scenario so you know i you know we kind of have to kind of pay more attention to the SEL 70 and you know think about uh, you know uh, what's going on in the kidney at this point you've got a dark immunofluorescence and you've got anka in the blood so you have to agree that probably the anka is what's driving the uh, driving the pathogenic mechanism so different scenarios. I've seen people with bona fide ANAs and ANCAs and just the ANCA driving the disease, no complexes. And, you know, we have the luxury of looking at um, <clears throat> electron microscopy as well. So the presence of deposits is very, very definitive in these cases, because sometimes you can get fooled at the other end as well, that your immune complexes are there. Now in Pakistan, since you don't have electron microscopy, there are other ways to do it. You can do Moussan's trichrome and they sometimes help you find where the immune complexes are and so on and so forth. But the same case, if I found a bunch of deposits on the electron microscopy, then my focus would shift back to the ANA and away from the ANCA because I wouldn't expect deposits with uh, the ANCA. So how, I, how would I resolve the issue at that time? I would pick up a paraffin embedded block and send it for pronase digestion. Uh, and that may unmask hidden deposits. So there's many different things that go in there, but it's very important to really focus on the pathology that you're looking at, the pathogenic mechanism that you're proposing before you start dishing out treatment. So I think this is a very good case in, in point from the biopsy standpoint, but once you're dishing out treatment, you can't just stop because the creatinine is high because you've determined that the creatinine was one, there's only mild to moderate ifta at this time. There are a few crescents, but doesn't look like there's overwhelming disease. So this kidney is salvageable and I wouldn't give up on it. So we are reaching at uh, like 3 p.m. mark very soon. So I think the, um, we had a wonderful, um, interesting discussion today. Um, thank you for helping me with my case as well. Um, so um, let me see if, uh, so the, any further questions or comments? I think we probably are reaching at the conclusion of the session now. Um, so you will all receive, I think that email has already been sent out about the evaluation. So please uh, make sure that uh, you uh, complete the evaluation um, and we go from there. So everybody have a wonderful, I think, good day and good night. And uh, uh, we all will see you next month. Thank you for a very comprehensive presentation. Omar. That was excellent. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Irfan, Dr. Umar, and Dr. Vas. I think uh, all of you, what are you doing? It's, uh, I think, let me say that. And it's a wonderful job that you are doing. Thank we you so are, much. Whatever we're doing, it's not like one person, but you are also a very important uh, member of the team. And everybody who's participating, and they bring the patient's cases, and they discuss, and eventually patients are the, who are getting benefit out of this. That's good. Thank you, Rishabh Ko, the office. The office.